I have returned, guys. So sorry about the absence. I was recovering from a sickness that really messed with my throat and vocal cords. But now, I'm happy to say I'm back. And not just back to my usual videos, but back to doing this wonderful micropasta series. Without further ado, here's Volume 9. I don't remember much about my childhood, like most people. Those memories are always vague, and eventually you realize whatever you remember is probably just a reconstructed memory. You don't have much of a choice in the matter, and are usually convinced that your memory would never fail you. The first memory I have was when I was five. I'm not sure if it's real or not, but that's when I think I met Michael. I never had any friends, so I was glad when I met him. He called me Jack, and I liked it. As uncertain I am if I remember our first encounter, there is no doubting the strong bond we immediately formed. I won't bore you with the details of what we did every day for the past few years, but I will outline some of the things we did together to assure even the most skeptical among the listeners of our friendship. Michael, being a slightly effeminate child, didn't have many friends at school either. He was bullied, and the highlight of his day was coming home and sharing a cup of tea with me, all the while telling me of his woes and lessening his burden. The tea, unlike my words of consolation, was make-believe. Another one of his favorite activities was cutting my hair. We would style it in all sorts of ways, and I enjoyed each one of them. Fortunately for him, my hair grew inexplicably fast, and he often got a chance to restyle it. There was one thing that constantly strained our relationship, though. Don't get me wrong, Michael and I had absolutely no hard feeling towards each other. It was his parents. I don't think they approved of me, and I couldn't tell you why even if I tried. It wasn't just disapproval. I began to think they hated me. The longer our friendship lasted, the worse it got. It pains me to even think about it, so I don't dwell on this for long. As quickly as our relationship had initially flourished, it began to diminish after two years. Michael grew to become a stock football player, and I remained exactly the same as before, scrawny and completely incapable of competing athletically. He made new friends and started to ignore me. This hurt me a lot, especially since I was there for him in his time of need. His abandoning me was the last thing I expected, and it hit me hard. I felt like I had no one left in the world. As I sit in the corner of the room and record this, I could see Michael and his friends watching TV. Sometimes it seems like he notices me, and looks my way, but I know better. I have now resigned to my fate. He created me, but forgot to destroy me. As I record this story of what just happened to me, my long-term memory is strangely hazy. It feels like I'm in a dream, where I have no idea how I learned the things I know, and no idea what events led up to this story's beginning. I walked out of a door and started running down a hall. I didn't know what my destination was, but all I knew was that I had to go there. There were other people who seemed to have the same idea, all running through the halls to the unknown destination. Some of them were slower than me, and I had to push past them while others who could outrun me would jostle me around. I knew I was getting close to the destination, as a noise somewhere ahead of me was growing louder every second. When I thought I was almost at the destination, I saw a sight that instantly made me stop. The people running ahead of me and coming around the next corner were being struck dead by an unseen force. As I watched spurts of blood shooting out of the people in front of me, I identified the noise we were running towards. Machine gun fire. 
I spun around and tried to run away from the torrent of bullets. I tried to run against the crowd but they kept slowing me down and pushing me in the direction of their impending demise. I tried to warn everyone as I ran face first into them but they acted like they didn't even see me. I gave up saving others and devoted all my attention in getting through the crowd when I realized that the sounds of gunshots were getting closer. The hall eventually came to a junction which allowed me to run down a new corridor that wasn't crowded. There I saw a door like the one I came out of and tried to see if I could find a hiding place inside. The door wouldn't open. I repeatedly pulled as hard as I could and tried hitting it, but it didn't move. When I was sure I couldn't open the door, I realized that the noise of the gunshots had died down. I looked to my side to see that the hall that was packed with people seconds ago was now littered with corpses. The only sound I heard was the soft, wet, muffled sound of people walking through the pile of bodies. It sounded like multiple people coming from the direction the shots came from and heading my way. I turned and ran away from the sound, only to be met with a dead end. I stood there, motionless and backed up against the wall as they came into view. Two men wearing full body armor and carrying assault rifles were walking by. One of them turned his head in my direction. He said something to the other, and they both walked up to me. They didn't shoot me for some reason. In fact, they seemed to be silently examining me for a short time. After about one second of intense silence, one of them spoke. What's he doing? He said in a high voice that didn't seem to match his large frame. They're starting to glitch already? So much for that advanced AI, said the other. After that, they just left. I have no idea what their words meant but they left me with an uneasy feeling. I may have survived, but I can't shake the feeling that I'm still in danger and something's gone horribly wrong. I wake up to darkness all around me. It's cold and chilling for the moment I first experience it. But soon, it passes. Slowly, almost lethargically, my eyes adjust to the ceiling, with the fan suspended in a state of stasis. Why darkness appears as a dark blue, I have no idea. As that thought passes through my mind, the ceiling changes colors. It's green now. Suddenly, the chill returns but transforms into a sense of euphoria. Believing myself to be having a vivid dream, I attempted to change the colors with a thought, but to no avail. As the mossy filter penetrates my mind as I think of other hues, I instead wish it away. It's yellow now. Jubilation pierces my heart, although I've nothing to be happy for in this context. I realize that when the color changes, my mood changes with it. The fan starts a slow, creaky rotation. I become annoyed, as I am still chilly. It's red now. I wish suddenly it didn't change, as I am filled with a fierce, uncontrollable anger. A sharp yell escapes me and rips upwards from the bed, gripping the spinning blades and pulling it down. It's a rainbow now. Suddenly, a cacophony of emotions jolts me instantaneously, as painfully as a cluster of bees swarming its attacker. I become unable to move and fall onto the bed. The fan dangles helplessly. I notice the angle in which it points in and try to use every muscle I can to get out of its way. To no avail. The cable connecting the fan to the ceiling snaps. It's blue now. The tip of a fan blade crunches down on my throat, causing me to gag, rendering me unable to breathe. I find myself able to move, and I shoot up. But I recall that I'm in a dream. I try to wake up as ink fills my retinas. It's black now. I'm not asleep. You are home alone, and you hear on the news 
about the profile of a murderer who is on the loose. You look out the sliding glass doors to your backyard, and you notice a man standing out in the snow. He fits the profile of the murderer exactly, and he is smiling at you. You gulp, picking up the phone to your right and dialing 911. You look back out the glass as you press the phone to your ear, and notice he is much closer to you now. You then drop the phone in shock. There are no footprints in the snow. It's his reflection. It was 4.23 a.m. when he awoke from his slumber, pulled in sweat, and for a moment, forgot where he was. He'd been drinking, of course. The alcohol often woke him early in the morning with the urge to urinate. His headaches were never this powerful. He stumbled into the dark hallway with a feeling of nausea. Suddenly, he heard a loud thump from downstairs. He quickly dismissed it as his mind playing tricks on him. But again, he heard the noise, now very loud. He gripped the handrail and quietly peeked his head down the stairs. It was pitch black, but the noise was obviously coming from the kitchen. He took a single step downstairs, and thankfully, the floor didn't creak. He took another step, and another, and another. Before he knew it, he was at the bottom of the stairs. At this point, the noise had stopped. Whatever was making that noise was watching, waiting. He cautiously walked towards the kitchen, his feeling of nausea replaced by fear and terror. He heard a step from behind and he snapped back, but found nothing. He turned back around, still nothing but darkness. From out of nowhere, he heard a window shatter, and he grabbed his baseball bat. He walked into the kitchen and looked at the back door. The window was shattered, but there was no glass on the floor. His worst fears had been confirmed. Whatever was in his house had left. I've never liked children. I never really knew why. I have seen them so many times. I decided to contemplate it for a while. I think it stems down to innocence. Not that I'm jealous of their innocence, but rather that I pity them for it. Children are full of potential. They could grow up to be anything they want until life sets in and society crushes their spirits. Their dreams become splintered, their hopes broken into shards. At a young age, they're encouraged to be individuals, to be unique, march to the beats of their own drum. Then as they get older, they're told to be a team player, or basically another cog in the machine that is society. And those who don't submit get left behind, shunned for not trying to subvert their true selves. They're the ones I tend to see sooner than they would expect. I say it'd be easier if the elders would be upfront about these things and not feed them false delusions. But I can't back that up. I think they give them these lies so they don't give up so easily. When I look at children, I see disappointment and anguish. Obviously not at that present moment, but rather their reaction when social protocol dictates they abandon their identity. Now, I understand that people's lives never turn out the way they thought it would. That doesn't bother me. In fact, at this point I feel it should be anticipated. I just think they shouldn't be left with these delusions about destiny. It's strange that one would pity such a small creature but I suppose I just have a soft spot for the blind and weak. When people see me, they often think of me as melancholy and depression. They think I don't like my job 
and that I'd rather switch to a different path. They're right. I'm rather sullen, but not because of the job I do. Rather, it is the feeling I get when I meet people while doing my job. I just see the disappointment in their eyes, yet there's little I can do to help them. I've tried consoling them, easing the disappointment of the path they chose, but it never seems to work. I see children grow into adults when they become depressed and broken. When they do meet me, they usually have little to say. It's always, I need to get something done or I'm not quite ready. It's hard when I have to look into their eyes as they say, Azrael, can I just have a little more time? It makes me shed a tear or two, sigh and lower my scythe. No matter how much I pity them, seeing their lives go unfulfilled, I always have to say, No. A beautiful young girl is left home alone, with only her dog to protect her. On the news that night, they announce that there is a serial killer on the loose in the area. Before she goes to bed, she locks all the doors and tries to lock all the windows, but the one in the basement won't lock. She decides to leave it unlocked, but locks the basement door and goes to bed. Her dog takes its customary place under her bed. In the deep of night, she awakens to a dripping sound coming from her bathroom. Half awake, the girl feels the comforting lick from her dog and falls back to sleep. She reawakens to the dripping sound, reaches her hand down to the dog where she feels the reassuring lick and falls back to sleep. Once more, she awakens to the dripping sound. She reaches her hand down and feels the lick of her dog. Now curious about the dripping sound, she gets up and slowly walks towards the bathroom, the dripping sound getting louder as she approaches. She reaches the bathroom and turns on the light. She is greeted by a horrific sight. Hanging from the shower nozzle is her dog with its throat slid open and its blood dripping into the bathtub. Something on the bathroom mirror catches her eye. She turns around. Written on the wall in her dog's blood are the words, Humans can lick too. I do hope you enjoyed this collection of micropastas, ladies and gents. I hope you didn't mind me leaving a little urban legend at the end. I thought it would be rather fitting. Now, I hope you all have a lovely night's sleep. Try not to let the nightmares get to you too much. And be ready, everyone, because during the month of October, I plan on delivering nothing but spooks. Stay tuned. <laughs>